All right, I'm just going to go ahead and get started since this is being recorded, and I'll post it later. Um, so this is my presentation that I did at Adobe Cold Fusion Summit. I'm sorry to anyone who couldn't be there to see it in person. Um, Summit was pretty good this year. There was a lot of great topics, I think. Um, a lot of AI stuff, a lot of uh, cloud stuff, um, some containerization stuff. So um, all the things that um, a modern language should be doing, uh, Cold Fusion is doing. Let me hide this control panel real quick. All right. So the agenda today, we're going to talk about, um, you know, what concurrency is briefly. Um, we're going to look at several resource efficient coding patterns. Um, talk a little bit about some caching strategies, both uh, native CF and cache box. Um, and then we're going to look at some not so often talked about database performance optimizations. Um, and then we'll have some Q&A at the end. Um, the presentation and some of the code that I demonstrate um, during this presentation is available on my GitHub um, at CS723-Preso-Assets. Uh, who am I? My name is Dennis Springle. I am currently working for CF Web Tools, but I'm looking for my next challenge. Uh, there's my email. I've been developing since 3.1. Um, I think I really got hot and heavy into Cold Fusion in 4.5, um, but I, I have dabbled in it since 3.1. Um, I am a polyglot. I do Java Node, a little bit of Python, pretty much anything that... Uh, I've been thrown at over the years, um, but uh, primarily I am a Cold Fusion guy. Uh, not a big social media guy, but you can find me on LinkedIn at Tenard Springwell IV. Uh, and yes, I am the fourth. There is no fifth, um, even though I have children, just so you know. Okay, so what is concurrency? Uh, concurrency basically is a measure of how many active requests can be serviced at the same time, right? So the more concurrent users you have, the more concurrent requests you have, the more resources such as CPU and RAM and input output are going to be required. Uh, so most companies focus on uh, two approaches, horizontal and vertical scaling. Um, typically, uh, horizontal scaling includes maximizing um, the RAM, CPU, and I.O. in a single server. So having a, as tall a server as you can, um, as they like to say in the industry. And then configuring everything on that server, including containers and and application servers to perform um, best and use the best resource utilization, uh, then most companies just jump over to vertical scaling and then load balance those things together. Um, skipping the part that we're going to talk about, which is optimizing the application code to use as few resources as possible. Um, I've seen companies that will go out and scale up to 30 servers when had they taken you know a month or two to go through um, their code and do some of these performance optimizations, they could have done it in 10. Um, and I've been with companies that had 30 and taken them to 10. So um, it's very possible to save a lot of money um, by doing these things. And if you learn to implement them in your daily routine, um, you'll just generally have better performing applications. So there's a whole lot of different resource efficient coding patterns. Um, most of the time people hear the word coding pattern and their eyes start to glaze over. Um, but object orientation, model view controller, functional programming, these are called patterns um, in the parlance of, of uh, software development. Um, and you should use them. Um, they are there for a reason because they are proven techniques that are um, solve a lot of problems. One of those being um, resource efficiency. Um, especially the modern frameworks that we have in Cold Fusions, um, in particular Framework One and Cold Box, um, are engineered to be as quickly quick as they they can possibly be. Um, you can also get a better performance out of not using an, uh, an NBC if it doesn't fit your your particular pattern. Uh, you don't have to be tied to it, but um, in general, you'll get more performance out of using an MVC pattern than not. Uh, use script versus tags. Obviously, I, I am a script person. Um, I, I do not actually know if the faster compilation and execution is true, but um, I do know that writing code in script um, has multiple benefits, one of which is speed of writing the code. 
um, and ease of reading the code and the knowledge of actually writing in that format um, such that you can, you know, write in other languages because aside from Cold Fusion and arguably PHP, there is no other modern language that has a tag-based um, functionality. Um, so writing script will make you more efficient in, in other ways, even if the, the compilation and execution it turns out not to be quicker. Um, avoid scope cascading, implement a fast exit strategy, break out of loops and continue over loops. Um, avoid using the string processor. So instead of putting hashtags around variables and wrapping them in strings um, when you don't need to, and this is the same for if you're executing um, functions. Um, if you use either the hashtags or in any case, if you use hashtags, it runs through what's called the string processor. Um, which takes a couple more ticks um, of your processor and a little bit more RAM. So over a 1,000 requests, that can add up pretty quickly. Um, avoid creating unnecessary variables. Um, use threads um, as well as async um, and parallel uh, in Lucy, any version of Lucy. And now in ACF 2023, there is a parallel option when you are looping over things. Um, and a couple other uh, ways that you can use parallel parallelization. Um, so definitely take a look at that. Uh, implement Java directly. In many cases, Java will be faster. Um, in most cases, Java will be faster than Cold Fusion. But um, there are some ways you can implement Java directly pretty easily um, and save yourself a lot of processing time and power by using the the equivalent uh, Cold Fusion code. Um, and then obviously using casting strategies that will um, help return results quicker um, when you have complex calculations that take time. Um, it, you don't want a thousand people hitting that at the same time. You want one person at max hitting that and 999 other people enjoying the fact that that one person did it. Um, so that's where caching comes into play. So, so before it's scope cascading, what is scope? Scope is where the variables are located in memory uh, as far as how Cold Fusion arranges them. So, and they are in this order depending on where you are, um, either inside a CFC or inside a CFM, or if you're inside a loop or a query, they change. But in this order, uh, Cold Fusion will look at the local scope, the argument scope, the thread local scope if you're inside a thread, the query scope if you're inside a query loop, uh, the thread itself, variables, CGI, CF file, URL, form, cookie, and client. Um, so when no scope is provided for Cold Fusion, it, what it does is called scope cascading. It starts at local, looking for that argument, uh, looking for that variable, rather. And if it doesn't find it, it moves on to arguments, then the thread local, then blah, 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 blah. Um, URL and form, um, some of the most highly used for, uh, variables, as you can see, are way down the line. Um, so if you are not scoping variables, you are um, effectively wasting time letting Cold Fusion or requiring Cold Fusion rather to go through each scope to find the variable that matches. Uh, there's also some ambiguity and some potential security threats in doing this. Uh, for example, if you're looking for a value in a cookie and someone either passed in a URL or form value, uh, since URL and form is evaluated before cookie, the value could be overridden um, on the URL. So there's some security implications to not scoping your variables as well. Um, but always scope your variables. It will make your applications a lot faster. Uh, scope cascading is horribly, horribly, horribly slow. Um, and then obviously inside of your functions, you want to var scope your variables um, either with var or by doing a local dot. Um, type of implementation. Um, that's personal preference either way. Um, but do do that. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that, including um, concurrency, race conditions, um, and things like that. Delayed exits. We've all seen this and done this at some point in our career, um, where we check for the existence of something. And if we have it, we go off and do whatever process we want to do. And then at the end, we have an else that says, no, we got to do something else. Um, and it, it compounds. I've seen 
you know, nested if else situations in most of the code I've worked on most of my career. Um, and what these do is they keep the request open longer. Um, you might think that if it doesn't exist, it goes directly to the else. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that it still runs through a process that includes taking away RAM and CPU cycles um, with the code that's inside of there. So always do what we call a fast exit strategy. So fast exits determine, do I have the data that I need if I don't stop processing, right? There's, there's no reason to process anything, just stop. Um, so here's an example of doing that instead. Um, so, you know, in this case, we are checking if the fast UI exit, uh, oh, sorry, go back. I forgot I can't do that. Um, so we're checking if the fast exit UID exists um, and has length. If it doesn't, we just go ahead and relocate with a message to let the user know they didn't provide it or whatever we want to do. Um, we also have a, another required field here that we want. Um, and then we are going to, in another use case, we're going to try and decrypt this and we catch it. If we can't decrypt it, we, you know, get out. There's nothing we can do. Um, only once we get to here do we have everything that we need to process. So only once we get to here to reprocess. So the idea is just get out before. If you can't process the data, go ahead and get out. Um, and that what that does is it, it ends the request and allows the next request to be processed. Um, so it doesn't keep requests open very long and allows the next request to hop in out of the queue and get processed. Um, this will also speed up your applications fairly substantially. All right, break and continue. Um, these are ways um, most people know the switch case. Um, once you've satisfied a condition you want to break out of, um, a lot of people don't know if you have a default case specified and you don't break out of a previous case that was matched, it will execute the default case as well. Um, that can be used to your advantage as, or it can be a confusing, why is it doing this thing? Um, so always make sure you're breaking out of your, your cases. Um, the break can also be used in for and while loops. Um, so here's an example. We just want to know if the value that we need is available inside of this array. Uh, so we loop through the array. We figure out if that value is there. Um, once we have found that value, we have set our is found to true. We don't need to process anything else in that array. We can just break out of that loop, which ends processing on that loop, and then moves on to do something with is found being true or false. Um, so this is a, a handy way to... Um, once you have the value that you need, uh, stop processing through a loop um, because otherwise call fusion will continue going on regardless. So if you're at, you know, you, you're processing a thousand items in an array and item number three happens to be the value you're looking for, unless you tell call fusion to stop at that point with break, it's going to process everything else till it gets to the end of the thousand items. And as you can imagine, that wastes time. Uh, the um, opposite of this is continue. So when data cannot be processed, there's no need to keep continuing through that array of objects, right? Um, and or it doesn't matter if it's arrays or structs or whatever you're processing, It's these are just an example. Um, so you're looping through an array of objects, let's say, um, you wanna check to make sure that that object has an ID, it's necessary to process it. Um, if it doesn't, you continue, it skips over that item in the array and moves on to the next one. So this is when you cannot process a specific item in a group of items, um, when you're looping over them, um, continue comes in handy. Um, break and continue also works work inside of functional programming. So if you are doing an each or you're doing a uh, map or reduce, um, you can use break and continue to either end processing that uh, that data or to continue over to the next item in that data. Um, so these work there as well. Uh, avoid variable creation. Um, we've all seen this. We've all done this at some point in our careers where we have a variable to get the temp directory. And then we have another variable where we uh, you know, we want to 
set the file name, but you know we want to change the space to another square, for example. Um, and then you know we want to return the value of those two concatenated together. In this case, we've created three variables. Um, in reality, we can simply return all of those functions um, and get the same value and not create a single variable. Um, the more variables you construct, the more RAM and CPU cycles will be used. Um, if you can avoid creating variables, do so. You will always get better performance um, because it's not having to waste the CPU cycles to reserve the RAM and then fill that RAM with the data um, and then return that RAM, that data from RAM. Um, it will construct and, and return on the fly and that uh, whatever RAM was used will be thrown in the GC um, nearly immediately so that it gets recycled. Um, so always, always, always do your best to avoid constructing variables um, unless they're absolutely necessary. Um, and the, the best thing I always tell everyone, and I've been telling this for years, um, is that, you know, you want to know your language. You want to avoid any of the CPU and RAM intensive functions when alternatives exist. Um, for example, using struct key exists versus struct find. Um, struct key exists, looks at the keys, struct find goes through the entire struct. Um, you know, using A++ instead of increment value. Um, increment value is probably nice to have in, you know, version three and four, um, but it has had no real value since at least then. <laughs> um, use a ternary operator instead of inline if. Inline if it's horribly slow. Um, ternary is a hell of a lot faster. Um, and, you know, use functional programming techniques. Um, they are typically faster than loops, not always. Um, it, if you really want to know whether a loop or a, a functional approach is faster, you can, you know, check the milliseconds that it takes to execute each individual version of it. Um, and then obviously choose the faster one. Um, but typically I found that map reduce filter each and, and the other functional um, programming techniques um, end up being faster. Um, and, you know, cold fusion is in your, is a tool in your tool belt, um, among many others. Um, but you should master it as you would any other tool. Um, if you were a car mechanic, you would master wrenches and sockets and things of that nature. Um, as a software engineer, you should master your language, um, as much as possible. Um, so that's that. We're going to move on to some caching strategies. Um, so what is caching? Um, in a way, it's basically a way to offset uh, resource utilization um, and to store data, um, specifically data that is um, complex to produce, um, but not always. Um, so it, it, the, the data needs to be rarely changing. Obviously, if you're running a real-time application that's showing you know uh, real-time market value or market cap of a stock you're not going to want to delay that um, by much um, but there are uh, plenty of use cases for using cash um, and primary reasons is it reduces load on the application and database servers um, it does allow for greater throughput requests that require just-in-time data rendering and handling. So um, if you have a complex calculation and it's something that can wait 5, 10, 15 minutes um, even, um, then to be recalculated, um, then you know go ahead and throw it in the cache for five minutes. That five minutes of those requests not having the process every time is going to save your server um, on requests and time. Anyway, so even if it's a shallow um, expiration on these cached items, it still has tremendous value, especially at load. Um, the more users you have, obviously, the more those requests are being made. If the data is already in cache and it can be pulled out and spat out in a matter of milliseconds versus taking 300 milliseconds for each request to process those, then cache becomes um, very useful. Um, and obviously, it increases the performance and responsiveness by doing that. Um, and I've used it, um, frankly, even on just queries that make up, you know, frequently requested but not time-sensitive data. So um, a user list, for example. 
Um, I used to work for a company that we had conference software where you know, people wanted to look up the other attendees. Um, once we have that data, you know, unless something changes, unless a, an attendee is added or attendee edits themselves, um, those changes are irrelevant. Um, so we cache until those changes are made. And at the time that those changes are made, we clear the cache of that data so that on the next request, the cache gets picked up again. But for everyone in between, the database is no longer involved at all. There's no IO for that. Um, it, in theory, on these very tall servers, it stays in RAM. And if it doesn't, it is moved over to the file system, which nine times out of 10 these days is going to be an SSD anyway. Um, so the IOPS are pretty quick. So you will you will increase performance throughput even in small ways by doing things like that. And we'll look at some of the some of the ways that I've done that before. Oops. Um, so there are native cache functions built into Cold Fusion. Um, cache get and cache put in particular, um, or how you get and put data in. Um, this pattern right here is a pattern that you can use um, everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. Um, so basically, you want to get the data out of the cache. Um, so you instantiate a variable with by getting the cache data by the name of the item you stuck in the cache. Um, you check if that value is null. If it's null, it's not no longer in the cache. Call Fusion will return a null value to you. Um, and a lot of times you will want a way to force a reload of cache data for reasons. Um, one of those being that you know the data has changed, obviously. Um, so you may want to have some way of doing that. Um, so you check for that as well. Um, and if we don't have it and we have to, you know, or we're reloading it, we do whatever complex process that we need to get the data. We put that data back in the cache. Um, with its name and then, you know, a time span. Um, this is days, hours, minutes, seconds when you do create time span. Um, and then you can do something with the data. So the one consistent thing that you'll see throughout is that I've, I've instantiated a variable my data. I'm checking that my data is null. If it is, I'm populating my data and storing it. Um, so at the end of this, regardless of whether or not we've got the data from the cache or we recreated it, we will have my data populated with the data we want. Um, so that pattern right there is something that you can use um, for any data that you want to cache. Um, obviously, naming the items has to be unique. Um, so be careful of that, um, which brings me to those specific cases where the, you have a user-specific caching pattern or a session-specific caching pattern or some data or combination of data caching pattern um, that you want to represent data. Uh, a good example of that is, hey, I do want to cache, you know, the history of this stock over the last five years um, because I don't want to have to calculate that every time a user asks for it um, within a reasonable amount of time, you know, a day perhaps, eight hours, maybe, whatever it is. But um, make sure that you pay attention to those specific things and that you add some kind of argument to the naming of the cache, um, which is the, really the only thing that's changed on this slide, um, is that I add the user ID in this case to the naming of the cache so that it becomes user specific. Um, so always make sure you're, you're aware of this um, because you don't want Bob to log in and see Seth's information that he cached um, by forgetting to add that. Um, and I only mention it because I've been there <laughs> and I've seen it. A lot of people go there. So um, good to bear in mind. Um, so these days I don't use cache, get cache put directly. I'm either using um, cache box or I have a cache CFC that I have written um that i have a get and set function for um and other functions that we'll see i'll show you that code in a minute but same basic pattern the only difference is that we've somehow either instantiated or injected cache service into wherever we're using the cache and we have a get um we're still checking if it's null still checking if you know we're clearing it 
um, and still doing the complex process if we don't have it. Uh, and we're essentially doing a set back to it um, with this, the name, the value, and then I have added a function to my particular cache CFC that doesn't require create time span for all these because I, I hate typing it. Um, so I have one that you can specify, you know, one hour, one minute. Uh, you can specify, you know, two days, three hours, 14 minutes, and 33 seconds. Um, and it will parse that out and do a create time span for the actual caching part. Um, that's my own personal flavor on this. Uh, the reason I use get and set is because CacheBox uses get and set. Uh, my cache.cfc also has a put because um, I have found in training other developers that uh, get and put feels more familiar to them, um, primarily due to their experience with using cache get and cache put in Cold Fusion. Um, so I do have a put alias that just redirects the arguments to set, but that might be something to consider depending on, um, you know, again, personal preference. But get and set is what you will see inside of CashBox. CashBox is a product by Ordis um, that provide, provides some multiple enhanced features over what you can get out of native Cold Fusion. Um, those include cache aggregators, which is the ability to aggregate multiple caching engines. You could have a Redish cache with a EH cache backup um, that are aggregated together, that data is stored in both. If your Redis cache goes away, your EH cache is still there. Um, it could be 18 Redis caches, and if one of those goes away, you've got 17 other caches still there. Um, cache aggregation is, is very handy, especially when you get to very high throughput applications um, that have a lot, a lot, a lot of users. Um, at one of the companies I worked for, we started with a product that could support about a thousand users um, and ended up with a product that could support over 50,000 users concurrent um, over the same set of servers uh, simply by adding cache aggregators into the mix. Um, it has a simple API with common functions get and set across all the aggregate engines. Um, so that it's the same functionality regardless of what you're using behind it. Uh, it is convention-based, but it also has runtime configuration options. You can create a cache on the fly, which is cool and has come in handy. Um, you cannot do that in standard Cold Fusion. Um, and then there is a cache monitoring dashboard and commands panel to do things like check the the cache hits and clear the cache items and things like that. Um, you can use it with or without cold box. It is built into cold box, but it can be pulled out and has been pulled out as a separate product in the box ecosystem um, and can be injected with DI1 um, or simply just um, added into the application scope and used that way. Um, but it is a, if you're looking for advanced caching features, this is one of the first places you're going to want to turn. Um, at some point, you will turn to Terraform beyond that, um, depending on um, the enterprise kind of stuff that you're working with. Um, but CashBox and Terraform work well together as well. Um, Terraform is a is a uh, a caching engine. Um, it's where who makes EH cache, um, but it's caching on steroids. Um, and CashBox they work very well together. Um, so that's pretty much in on Cashbox. Um, you know, go and look at, at Cashbox if you're looking at, for a caching solution. Um, it's not for everyone. Some people prefer the native functionality, um, which is good enough for them. But if you are looking for advanced functionality, then Cashbox is definitely one of the places you want to look. And then we're going to get out of here a second. And we're going to look at some code. So this is my cache.cfc. Um, it takes a property of entity. You can call it whatever you want. Prefix um, is what it really ends up being. Um, and then um, we pass that in on a init and then set the entity value to whatever we pass in. So, for example, in my security service, um, I'm passing in an entity of security cache. So in here, every it sets the entity of security cache underscore. 
And then anytime we get or put, we get the entity and then whatever item name that we are passing in. Um, that allows separation of concerns um, between different CFCs using the same cache um, and allows you to separate those out so that if you have to clear uh, a specific set of cached items, you can do so with more pinpoint accuracy than wiping out everything in the cache. Um, so that's why I use the entity as a prefix. Um, so there's a get function, there's a set function. Again, I, I set the time to live from this uh, get time span from cache, which is based on whatever's passed in. Um, we'll look at that briefly. Um, there's obviously we want to be able to clear items out of the cache, clear all items with the prefix out of the cache, right? So um, that's a handy way for doing that. Um, this could be done as a filter, and um, that's normally how I would do it. Um, I didn't for this presentation, but normally I would do that. Here's the alias command of put, which basically just calls set and passes whatever arguments were passed in. Get time span from cache. Um, there's a lot of code here, but at the end of the day, it sets up the struct, days, hours, minutes, seconds, as they correlate to the create time span. Um, and it stores those in cache itself and also has this zero time span in cache, so it doesn't have to create it every time. And if we already have it, it just returns it, so we don't have to calculate it every time. Um, but otherwise, it basically just goes through the elements so if you passed in something like uh, one day, four hours, 33 minutes, and 45 seconds um, into this cache time, it's going to break those down. It's going to go through and say, OK, do I have days? Yes, OK. So add it to the day. Do I have hours? Yes, add it to the hours. Do I have minutes? Yes, add it to the minutes, add it to the seconds. And then it basically just uses the struct to create your time span puts that in the cache for later use, and then returns it. Um, so it's just a, a shortcut way of doing this notation instead of doing create time span on every single time you need to use cache with the native functions. Um, this is available um, on my GitHub, where I showed you earlier. Um, so that's, that's pretty much caching in a nutshell. Um, basically, inside of my functionality now again normally i use cash box um, this is a cool way that if you've got things that should be injected and you're not sure if this this service or this cfc is going to be used inside an environment with injection um, dependency injection or without um, just check if it's null and if it is then use the the old new keyword and set it up right um, so in this case you know if i don't have a cache already passed in by a cache box, um, it will use my default cache CFC and create an entity. Um, and then somewhere in here, we have a uh, security cache. Uh, da, 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 should I have? No, we're not. Um, somewhere in here. Oh, maybe I'm just using set. Anyway, somewhere in here is a get and set. Oh, I remember now. This is the security service. And one of the other base services that I'm injecting, I think it's password details. I'm caching a, a dictionary file used to create uh, dictionary style passwords. Um, and so that's where that's used. But <clears throat> um, so that's that. I missed a slide, so I want to go back to it. Did I miss it? Did I not put it in here? Um, all right, so let's look at implementing Java directly. So implementing Java directly, let's, how would we do that? So um, here's a good use case. String Builder is a lot faster at creating and saving strings than, for example, a CF save content would be. Um, by leaps and bounds, this is faster. Um, so in my case, I am using it to append data in this you know, bean creator service that I have. Um, and out of the base service, it basically creates a Java object. 
of Java Lang string builder and initializes it as an empty string, stores that in this buffer property. Um, and then I have a get string buffer that basically duplicates that empty string builder buffer um, and sends it back, which is what I use inside of my functions um, to get a string buffer, append what I want to it. Um, and then when I'm done, I basically do a two string on it and it spits out the string that was built. Um, that's one cool use of, of the, um, of Java. If you really want to see Java heavily used and learn why, pretty much look at any orders product. Um, and you will find that they're using Java, um, quite heavily. Um, in this case, um, this is their concurrent store, uh, which is part of Cashbox, um, and it uses the concurrent hash map uh, from Java. Um, a concurrent hash map is a way of storing data where when you go to retrieve data, it locks only the specific row of data that you want instead of the entire page of data, um, which makes concurrency go up because you can read and write um, rows of data concurrently, hence the name concurrent hash map. Um, and using concurrent hash map along with the caching strategies of Cashbox um, basically makes everything just even a little bit faster, right? So you're you're using a concurrent hash map to store the cache data. Um, you pass in the key; it knows to lock that row, get that data, bring it back out, and not touch anything else. Um, and then at some point, then they want to. Um, uh, da, 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 da. so get the keys um, so the keys that are in the cache they just get their lava, they get their Java collections which is using Java util collections um, and using the list function with the keys that are in this variables pool which ultimately is this concurrent hash map okay so dropping into Java in even the simplest of ways with a create object can speed up your applications quite a bit. Um, knowing what things to use in Java to do that um, is another uh, animal entirely, but here's, I've just taught you two cool things you can use in Java today that will speed up your applications. Um, during one of my presentations, Brad was actually, Brad Wood was sitting there and he's like, oh man, you know, I, I could actually just use that here in command box instead of looping over this data. And uh, in, in 10 minutes, he had rewritten some part of, of command box um, to use concurrent hash map um, to speed up command box. So um, there's just better ways to do things sometimes in in Java. Um, and in today's modern cold fusion, you can actually write entire blocks of Java code directly in a CF. Uh, a CFM or a CFC um, in tags or script. Um, we won't, that's kind of beyond the, the scope of this presentation, um, but you can go look it up. There's um, some stuff out there to look at. Um, one more thing on caching, since I'm talking about it, and this came up during my actual presentation. This is a, an old, uh, a very old service that I, pattern that I used to use. However, um, it has some some capabilities that um, are kind of cool. Um, so this basically has all my CRUD stuff that I would have, right? Um, the, the blah, 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 blah. It's got this filter function. So filter is when I want to get you know a record set out of the specific table um, or specific view, um, database view. Um, and so we go in and we can get that data but we've got some extra things here that we can use. Um, so we can cache that data on that query. Um, and again, we need a flag to know if we want to clear the cache, um, how much time to store it in the cache. And then this 30 read thing we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but it basically goes through. And then when it gets to the filter, it says, okay, are we, are we caching? Is this true? Oops. Um, and we're not clearing the cache. Okay, it is. Let's let's get it out of the cache. Okay, in this case, guess cache TWN request log query 
is basically hashing a serialized JSON of the filter we passed in. Um, and this basically in this code, and I'll show you in a minute, basically just does a cache get um, out of the cache using this hash as the name of the cache item. Um, and then if we have it, we return it. If we don't, okay, we got to make the query again. We go on and we make the query. Um, we check again here at the end. Are we caching? Yes. Okay, let's delete anything that might be left over in the cache. Um, this is in the case if we are actually... Um, oh, so we're, we're deleting the clear cache value out of the filter because we don't want to... When we originally filtered this, we don't have that. Um, so we want to make sure that we're this hash is the same. Um, so then we just basically set that into the uh, into the cache, um, so that the next time this cache with these arguments that are in filter are passed in, we return the same result. Um, some of you guys on this call are familiar with this pattern because you were around when I built it, but. Um, and then there's a get cache prefix. Okay, so these are this is years old code that I ultimately rolled into. Why am I doing this in every service when I can have a single service that handles these things? Um, but you know, get a cache prefix, um, get the query out of the cache. In this case, it's again, it's just doing a cache get with the cache prefix, um, setting it in there with the cache put. Um, cache removing by a single ID, looping through all the items. So here's where I would have used a, a filter function to get all the specific items and then go through and cache remove each individual one. Um, and then that's about it's like, uh, some alias function I ult ultimately added because the naming here got unwieldy. Um, a lot of my techniques have changed since I was doing this, obviously. Um, but the the theory and the practice is still the same. Um, in this case, you know, I wouldn't be doing a cache put. I'd be calling my cache service and using the set, right? But otherwise, everything would be pretty much um, the same as far as how I'm using caching inside of here. Um, and again, the advantage of doing this at the service level um, and in fact, these days I'm going back to DAO versus just the service. Um, back years ago, I was using a service-oriented architecture and skipping the DAO, um, and that worked pretty well. Um, but I, I have found I've gone back and forth over the years on DAOs, um, but I have found some more useful um, reasons for using DAOs in recent years, so I have gone back to using them. Um, I may change that preference again in the future, but that's where I'm at these days. Um, but the uh, that cache pattern that we looked at is the same. It's just wrapped in all this code, right? Do, 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 do. All right, so it's the same pattern. It's just somewhere in here I'm doing my query. Right, and then I'm putting it in the cache, and somewhere here I'm checking: Am I getting cache data, or am I rerunning the query? Do I have it in the cache? If not, recreate the query. Right, but it's the same pattern inside that that giant CFC you just saw inside that filter function. Same pattern. Okay. Uh, now let's look at some database performance stuff. So store procedures. Um, indexing of relationship keys and utilizing dirty reads. Um, so store procedures, a lot of people don't like them, but at the end of the day, they are faster to execute than queries. Um, that should be an A, not a Q. <laughs> but um, so what you're doing when you store procedures, one of the things you're doing is you're offloading the creation of that execution plan from the application server um, and from the database server, since the store procedure is the execution plan. Um, but you're saving that CPU and RAM resources from the application server. You're offloading resources to the database server um, so they get processed there because the execution the store procedure is the execution plan. It doesn't have to calculate that, which makes it faster. It doesn't have to use the same amount of RAM um, and CPU, so it's faster. Um, and your cred 
functions can all reliably use store procedures and be faster. Um, and since CRUD is one of the primary functions of any application um, that uses a database to store data, um, then this is one of the, the key ways to use stored procedures. Um, there is a, a couple of, of different um, applications out there. Um, after my summit talk, and I forgot to add it to the slide, um, I did have a conversation with someone about something called uh, database.net um, that is a cheaper alternative to what I'm about to pro propose here of SMS tools pack. But in Microsoft SQL Server, there are at least these two tools that I know of, um, and I'm sure there's some in MySQL and other uh, Postgres uh, community stuff where they will generate CRUD stored procs for you. Um, I do CRUD stored procs in an optimum way these days, so I, I'd still write them myself. Um, but these will get you there. Um, what these produce, what both of these applications produce, either SSMS Tools Pack or database.net, um, will produce, will get you faster than you are now. Um, I have very specific use case for how I want stored procedures to return data. Um, nine times out of 10, I, and when I'm doing an insert, I only need the ID back. I don't need anything else um, because I'm already using an object in the code to uh, store that data. I just need to know what the ID is. Um, tools like SSMS Tools Pack will return all the values that are, were inserted. Um, it can obviously be modified not to do that, but that requires extra tooling. Um, so I just tool it myself. But if you want to start somewhere, it's a good place to start, um, especially if you don't know much about store procedures um, or how they are used. Um, SMS Tools Pack will get you there quickly and increase the speed of your application without having to know a whole lot. Um, and then you can go and research later on what you actually need and how to actually do that in a store procedure. And you can optimize your store procedures later down the line. Um, if you so choose to do that. Either way, you'll get more speed out of a store procedure than a query. Index of relationship keys, um, otherwise known as foreign keys. Um, I personally am not an actual foreign key advocate in that I don't um, actually create a foreign key relationship, um, but I do index those keys because indexing is essentially what is going to get you the fastest performance. Um, and when you create a foreign key, it's creating an index anyway. Um, but I don't like the uh, foreign key relationships to me are a way for DBAs to enforce behavior from developers. Um, and since I am the developer, I don't need them. I'm enforcing my own behavior um, or the behavior of my coworkers, as the case may be. Um, or I'm being told how to do it either way. Um, so I don't I don't generally subscribe to the the foreign the full foreign key relationship, but I do subscribe to integer primary and relationship keys. Um, integers are way faster than alternatives like GUIDs, and they suffer less page fragmentation. Um, I do still use GUIDs in my tables, um, and I use them wherever I need to pass an ID. Um, either on the URL or in a form or in some way that it could be public. Um, those values are typically also encrypted when I do that. And I use the GUID because if you encrypt the number one or the number two, um, it's not hard to figure out that it's the number one or the number two, um, for example. So integers are small and easy to uh, to find a rainbow table somewhere that can tell you that, yes, this is um, what that value is. Um, so I like to use GUIDs for that. Um, and the GUIDs are also indexed. But um, again, when when changes happen in the database, GUID pages fragment horribly, horribly bad. Um, and I used to love GUIDs. I used to prefer them as my primary key. Um, but I ran into situations where they were entirely too slow um, as I got into higher and higher concurrency applications. So into, uh, integer primary and relationship keys are the way to go. 
Um, indexing your relational keys, basically you expedite the, the process of finding that relational data, right? Especially when doing joins. Um, so it, it makes it uh, a lot quicker um, when you have an index for the database to find the data you're looking for. So that's something that a lot of people don't do. They index their primary keys, but they don't index the relationship keys. Um, index all your relationship keys and you will get better performance. Dirty reads, um, MySQL doesn't need them. Uh, Oracle can use them, but it's it's a lot harder. I shouldn't say MySQL doesn't need them. Uh, in an NODB um, has some locking. Uh, my ISAM does not have locking in the traditional sense, um, but Microsoft SQL for sure, um, unless you tell it not to, um, at a global level, will lock everything you do. Um, so you can use a table, a table hint called with no lock um, to basically do a dirty read, which means don't lock it, just get the value that's currently in there and give it back. Um, so if you are trying to do a concurrent write and a concurrent read with a dirty read, the lock will wait for the write to complete and then read the data that was written in there and give it back to you. With no lock, it will not care that it's being written to you. It will read the data that's currently in there and give it back to you, whether it's the correct data or not. Um, I found out at, a, at one of the companies that I was at that nine times out of 10 in that particular situation that we were working in, which was, again, a, a conference slash event application, the current data was irrelevant. Um, most of the data was in the system weeks before the launch of an of a conference or an event um so we didn't really need to worry about you know heavy rights messing with the data um so we used with no lock um initially we started it as an optional key that we could pass in um that was set originally false um and then ultimately we turned that true and we did dirty reads on pretty much everything and the exception was not using dirty reads um again this is is very application specific if you have data that is critical to have that lock in place to have the most current data returned don't use with no lock but if you don't use it liberally um you will again it speed up your applications considerably, especially database heavy applications. Um, the, the query literally consumes less memory because it's not holding a lock. Um, deadlocks don't occur because it's not holding a lock. Um, so there are some, a lot of advantages to using with no lock in high concurrency applications with Microsoft SQL Server. Um, and this table hint has been around since uh, <laughs> I want to say 2005, but it might have been earlier than that. Um, but it's been there forever. So, excuse me. Utilize 30 weeks. Um, I do have to thank all the people that got me out to Vegas this year. Um, the situation with my current company did not allow them to fund it as I expected. So I did create a GoFundMe this year. Um, and these are the people that have donated to it um, thus far. Um, it is still up. If anyone wants to help, feel free to send me a few bucks um, to help you know, recover the expenses that I, I put out to get out there. Um, but I, again, want to thank all the people that did help. Um, and I couldn't have, I couldn't have made it to Vegas this year without their help. Bottom line um, at all. So uh, thank you to all those guys. And now I will open it up to questions. And see if anyone's still around. All right. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of there. All right. Got a chat. Oh, thanks, Jason. Um, cool. Um, does anybody have any questions on anything I presented? Cool. Awesome. 
All right, guys, I appreciate everyone's time. I will be posting this up on mine somewhere um, so that everyone can uh, refer to it later. And thanks a lot, and I'll talk to you guys soon.